A Long Way from Chicago by Richard Peck The Phantom Brakeman, 1933 Down at Grandma's, the only thing that reminded us of home in Chicago was knee-high. That was orange pop at a nickel a bottle. With the 25 cents apiece that Dad gave Mary Ellis and me, we could each buy five knee-highs during our week if we could slip off from Grandma long enough to get our allowances spent. The coffee pot cafe kept the knee-highs along with the Great Bets and the Dr. Peppers in a sheet metal vat of ice water with a bottle opener hanging down on a piece of twine. Grandma said she didn't like knee-high because the bubbles in it gave her gas. Mary Ellis said anything that cost money gave Grandma gas. We made ourselves scarce the first afternoon and headed uptown before Grandma could find us some chores. I was thirteen at last, so I'd thank you to call me Joe, not Joey, and I walked a few strides ahead of Mary Alice. For one thing, she'd been taking dancing lessons all year and never went anywhere without her tap shoes and a drawstring bag. The greatest movie star in history was sweeping the country at, the f at that time, a girl younger than Mary Alice, named Shirley Temple. Shirley could sing and act, and she was a tap-dancing demon. Every girl in America was taking tap to be the next Shirley Temple. Though Mary Ellis was getting a little too leggy to be a child star, Mother said taking tap would give her poise. So Mary Ellis was apt to stop cold on a sidewalk and run through a tap routine in her regular sandals. I wasn't going to wait while she did that, so we each acted like the other one wasn't there. The only people in the coffee pot were a couple of farm women passing the time of day with Mrs. Ike Cripe. As proprietor, Mrs. Cripe wore a crocheted handkerchief pinned to her apron and a hairnet. She saw us come in, first the screen door closed behind me, then it opened again, and Mary Alice made her entrance. You could tell that Mrs. Cripe wanted our nickels before we fished the knee-highs out of the water. She was deep in conversation with the farm women, but when I started to put my nickel on the counter, her palm was outstretched to take it. Above on the wall was a framed picture of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who'd beaten out Hoover as President of the United States. He hung between two signs. The first sign, Double Yolk Breakfast Served All Day, with Sausage, Bacon, or Ham, Your Choice, 20 Cents. And, the other sign, blue plate special, liverwurst or tuna sandwich, cup of our coffee thrown in for ten cents. Mrs. Cripe and the farmer were remarking on what a handsome man Franklin Delano Roosevelt was. Don't it beat all how a man that good looking would marry a wife that plain? And one of the farm women who'd have known a thing or two about plainness. That Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt is as plain as a mud fence. Well, maybe she's a good cook, the other farm woman offered. Kissin' don't last, good cookin' does. Mrs. Cripe rang up two nickel sales on the register. Men don't have any idea about women, she said. This big statement quieted the farm woman. Then Mrs. Cripe said, They're cousins, you know. Who is? The Roosevelts. He married his cousin. The toothpicks stopped dead in the farm woman's mouth. You don't mean it. It was in the paper, Mrs. Cripe reached under her apron to adjust the strap. "'Was it legal?' a farm woman whispered. "'I couldn't say,' Mrs. Cripe replied. "'Them Roosevelts is an Illinois people.' "'Their voices dropped lower. "'I'd noticed before marrying her cousin was a touchy subject around here, "'but now it was time for our knee-highs. "'Half the pleasure was sticking your arm in up to the shirt sleeve to f "'and fishing the ice water for the bottle. "'Mary Ellis plunged in at her end.' We took our time. In those days, before air conditioning, just getting one arm cooled off was great. We elbowed aside the great bets. You didn't get enough of your money with a great bet, and it left your mouth purple. And the Dr. Peppers tasted like cough medicine. When we had our knee-highs in hand and open, Mary Ellis took a booth at the back. I settled at the table with the checkerboard in the front window. In the past, Mrs. Cripe had a fry cook and another lady working the counter, but she was down to herself now, except for a girl who was wiping the tables with a wet rag. You had to look twice to see her. She was that skinny and pale as a ghost. A light breeze would have shown her into the back room, would have blown her into the black back room. But she kept, she was keeping busy. She went at the tabletops like she was killing rats. When she worked her way to Mary Alice's booth, they fell into a murmuring conversation. 
Mary Ellis took out her tap shoes to show her, so it must be girl talk. I was glad to be up here away from it. I was coming to the age when I didn't know how near girls I was supposed to be. Mrs. Cripe didn't ring up a sale after the farm women left, so they may have come in just for the toothpicks. I was making my knee-high last. Then, from my seat in the window, I saw a woman pull up out front. She dropped down from a buckboard and tied her old mule to the rail. The mule wore a straw hat and the woman wore a sunbonnet. She was the toughest-looking woman you ever saw. She made Mrs. Ike Cripe look like a movie star. Stomping through the front door in a pair of unmatched, unmatching shoes, she made for the cash register. For a bad moment, I thought she was going to hold up the place. Well, Ms. Eubanks, Mrs. Cripe said, what is it? The sunbonnet woman, Ms. Eubanks, stuck a grubby paw under Mrs. Cripe's nose. Let me have my girl's wages. She jerked her head to the back booth where the wispy girl was lingering at Mary Alice's table. I gave her her 15 cents already today, Mrs. Cripe said. You done paid her before she worked out her day? Ms. Eubanks was confounded. A fool and her money is soon parted. She headed for the wispy girl whose eyes looked haunted and scared. Grabbing the front of the girl's uniform, she said, Give me that 15 cents or I'll turn you every way but loose. The girl hung there in her mother's grasp. Mary Alice sat below them, stunned. In a small voice, the girl said, I need my money. You don't have no needs except I say so, the woman barked, nose to nose with her. Cough it up. When she turned her loose, the girl reached down as slow as she dared and took something out of her shoe. It must have been the full 15 cents, because Miss Eubanks' hand closed over it, making a fist. She shook it at the girl, and when you get home, girl, I'll take your back wages out of your hide. Girl, you won't sit down till the first frost. I know what you're up to, Missy. You're sly, but you don't put nothing over on me. She stalked out of the place, past Mrs. Cripe, who hadn't liked being called a fool. The girl stood beside Mary Alice, trying not to cry. Mary Alice reached up to touch her hand. She was trying to say something to make the girl feel better, but I didn't look or listen. I didn't know what to do. Pretty soon we started for home. I'd left some knee-high in the bottom of the bottle, and I think Mary Alice did too. We walked together now. I waited when she stopped on an unbroken slab of sidewalk and went into one of her tap steps. She held her skirts out in a Shirley Temple way, but her heart wasn't in it. She was just going through the motions, and her mind was somewhere else. "'Who was that girl, anyway?' I said finally. "'Vandalia Eubanks,' she said. "'And that old crow in the bonnet was her mother. "'She wants to rule Vandalia's life.' I shrugged. "'Well, she is her mother.' "'She's her jailer,' Mariella said. "'Vandalia's seventeen. Seventeen? She doesn't look twelve. "'A starved seventeen, Mariella said. "'And she needs a friend.' Then her jaw clamped shut in Grandma's own way, and she didn't say anything else all the way home. When we got there, Grandma was out in the yard, standing over a thing made out of lumber in the shape of a teepee. Nearby was a pile of stove lengths on the circle of burned ground where she cooked down her apples for apple butter. She waved us over. We're making soap. Until we started coming to Grandma's, we thought soap was a pink bar that came out of a wrapper labeled cashmere bouquet, but that cost seven cents and Grandma made her own. She soon had us busy as bird dogs. She sent Mary Alice to the pump for pail after pail of water, and she sent me to the house for coal scuttles full of wood ash from the kitchen stove. Grandma poured the water through the teepee, which was a hopper. When it dropped through the ash, it came out as lye. Grandma caught it in a pan. We worked till supper time before we went inside. She built up a big fire from the stove lengths and shavings. After supper, Grandma and I worked through what she called the cool of the evening. Mary Ellis had managed to vanish, but the heavy work was over. The fire had burned down just right over the glowing embers. Grandma put an old pot on a tripod. We dumped the lye into it with just the right amount of water. Now she added what looked to me like garbage, ham skins, bacon rinds, and things too mysterious to mention. We took turns stirring the witch's brew as darkness crawled across the yard. 
The blossoms on the morning glory vine were little tight blue fists, and you could hear husky sighs from the cornfields across the fence. Grandma looked up, far out to the west, down where the road and the Wabash tracks seemed to meet. She scanned the far horizon, maybe waiting for me to ask what she was looking for. "'What are you looking for, Grandma?' "'The brakeman,' she said, still scanning. "'You mean a brakeman off the Wabash Railroad?' She nodded. "'This is about the time of evening he's been known to show. "'Who is he, Grandma?' She turned to me. "'You mean you never heard the story?' She took over the stirring, turning the paddle with both hands. "'It happened back in 1871, "'and it all came to pass because of the great fire of Chicago.' The, do- the town of Decatur was sending a special train full of volunteers up to fight that fire Mrs. O'Leary's cow started. Of course, railroad signals was very simple in them early times, and it was a foggy night. Somehow the train full of firefighters got on the same track as a Wabash freight train. They met head-on. It was just a half a mile along them tracks, down by that stand of timber on the way to Salt Creek. Grandma nodded down to the road to the timber, a dark smudge in the distance. Killed a brakeman on the freight train and both engineers. Oh, you never saw such a mess. Grandma shook her head. I was only a babe in arms, but I remember it well. My ma walked the tracks down there and held me up to see it. They'd pried the locomotives apart and taken out the dead. But it was a sight to behold. They said the dead bodies looked like they'd been fed through a sausage grinder. I swallowed hard, but I was always interested in anything from her early life that might explain Grandma. The paddle in her hand turned slow in the foul brew as she looked down to the dark woods. Unfortunately, that wasn't the end of the story, she glanced my way. The brakeman's been seen since. The darkness deepened around us, and a star or two came out. The brakeman who got chewed up like he'd been through the sausage grinder? Grandma nodded. Years go by without a sighting. Then on a hazy night, somebody will see the brakeman down there between the rails, swinging an old-time railroad lantern. Or they'll spot a dim yellow light deep in the timber, like he's a wandering soul still trying to head off the oncoming train. Grandma, I said in a breaking voice, though my voice was beginning to break anyways, are you talking about the brakeman's ghost? She pursed her lips to give a considered opinion. I don't say one way or the other. All I know is some people won't go down that road after dark by themselves. Grandma had hiked her skirts to keep them out of the fire, and the glowing embers made it hot as noon, but goosebumps popped out of my arms. Of course I'm talking about ignorant people, Grandma said. Superstitious people. I had some trouble settling down that night. It was the first night of the visit, so that was normal. But every time my eyes closed, I saw the phantom brakeman with the hamburger meat for a face, swinging a ghostly lantern through tree branches like skeletons. So I was up and down. His bad luck would have it. My bedroom window looked west to the haunted woods. I keep getting up to look. I'd keep getting up to look at the case in a case a lantern was swinging in the trees, but I didn't see anything. Then I was no sooner asleep than I was awake again. Some sound woke me. I didn't move in the bed, hoping not to hear any more, but I heard some snuffling like crying. It seemed to come from Mary Alice's room. I thought I heard her voice, too. Just a few words, though she never talked in her sleep. Now I was bolt awake, and the goosebumps were back. Wearing only my BVDs, I got up and looked out the hall. Mary Alice's door was shut tight, though we never closed our bedroom doors, hoping for a breeze. I crept over, but didn't try the knob, which was bound to be locked. I rapped lightly. This brought forth a little startled yipping sound from inside. Quicker than I'd awakened her, little feet padded across her creaking floor. Her keyhole spoke. What? Mary Alice, are you alone in there? Who wants to know? Who do you think? Are you? No, she said, and don't whisper so loud. Who's in there with you? A puppy. A puppy? I said, where'd you get a puppy? The cow house. 
You don't go in the cob house, I said. He came out. He followed me home. I'm calling him Skipper. That's what you're hearing, Joey. Don't tell Grandma. She doesn't believe in indoor pets. I gave up, though I didn't quite believe in the pet either, Skipper or whoever, but I was too tired to argue. I went back to bed and slept like a log. Grandma had already eaten her breakfast. She was at the stove fixing ours, sausage patties, which reminded me of the brake man, and buttermilk biscuits and fried eggs over easy. Mary Ellis turned up promptly, looking perky and innocent. I remembered Skipper. When Grandma's back was turned, Mary Ellis broke open a biscuit and struck a sausage patty inside it. Then she pushed it down her skirt. She knew I was watching, but she didn't meet my eye. The eggs were runny, so that was a problem for her. She thought about making an egg sandwich to go with the other biscuit, but gave it up. When Grandma turned back to the table, Mary Ellis had licked her platter clean. She skidded out of her chair and was gone back upstairs. Grandma gave her departing figure a long look. She'd mentioned that the night air would cool her brew to soap, so we went outside to see. The embers were white, and sure enough, the pot was solid with soap. Something like soap. It reminded me of the cheese she fed the catfish, and it didn't smell much better. My job was to pry it out of the pot. Grandma hankered in the grass with a butcher knife to carve it into cakes. This here's good soap, she remarked as she went at it with the knife. It lathers good, and it'll make the top layers of skin right off you. It'll take it right off. The sun hadn't been up long, and the morning glories were just beginning to unfurl. Then far down the road, a cloud of dust appeared heading for town. Nearer, it was Ms. Eubanks, the strings on her sunbonnet flying. She was standing up in her buckboard with a whip in her hand. Her old straw-hatted mule was galloping. I'd never seen a mule break into a trot, let alone a full gallop. The buckboard sped past the house, never slowing for town. Grandma stood up to watch it pass, fingering her chins thoughtfully. She gave me the chore of scrapping out the soap pot, which looked like a long day's work. I had to roll the pot in the grass and climb halfway in with a wire brush to loosen the clinging soap. It was a mean job, and some very strange-smelling stuff had gone into that soap. Grandma said that the full recipe for it would die with her. In an hour's time, I hadn't made a dent in it. By then, Mary Alice had come out on the back porch wearing her tap shoes. She began to run through one of her routines, calling out the steps. Shuffle, ball, change, step, step, shuffle, ball, change, step, step. I was scraping away on the pot, and she was tapping away on the porch, and if you ask me, she was acting entirely too innocent. We heard a clapping of hooves and a jangle of harness, and here came Ms. Eubanks in her buckboard back from uptown. She swerved into Grandma's side yard and drew up. The old mule was foaming at the mouth and looked near death. Its straw hat was hanging from an ear. Ms. Eubanks dropped down and lit running. She pounded up on the back porch, shoving Mary Alice aside. But even Ms. Eubanks didn't quite dare to storm into Grandma's house. She gave the screen door a savage rattle, though. Grandma appeared big behind the screen wire. Well, Idella, she said, what have you got a burr under your tail about now? Ms. Eubanks was wheezing. She turned up the sleeves of her feed sack dress. I need my girl back. You've got her in there. What have I got? That's yours, Grandma queried. Vindalia, you've got her. She didn't come home last night, and she ain't at work today. She was seen coming in this house. That girl done brought her. Ms. Eubanks poked a finger in Mary Alice's face, which was frozen with fear. I was observing the scene over the rim of the soap pot, and I was all eyes. Who's seen her coming here? Grandma said. I didn't. Everybody in town, Ms. Eubanks barked. Grandma nodded. She knew everybody knew everything, often before it happened. Well, let me tell you how it'll be, Adela, Grandma said in a reasonable voice. If you want to search my house, you'll have to get past me, and I'll tell you something else for free. If you set foot over that door sill, I'll wring your red neck. 
Miss Eubanks made one of her fists and seemed about to put it through the screen door. She was dancing with rage. With a strangled cry, she dashed off the porch, heading for the buckboard. Her old mule saw her coming in shield. She rattled off the property, and Mary Ellis stood there on the porch, wilting. Things quieted down after that. Grandma disappeared from the screen door. I went back to scraping the pot, and pretty soon Mary Ellis went back to practicing her tap, but real slow. Her timing was all off. By noon, I knocked off work for a stop at the privy before dinner. I was almost in it with only one thing on my mind when something moved in the cob house door. Somebody was there, and he stepped out into my path. I nearly jumped over the privy. It was a guy in a tight suit, a high collar, and a silk necktie. I'd seen him uptown, but couldn't put a name to him. He looked me over and decided I was old enough that he'd have to deal with me. Junior Stubbs, he said, putting out a hand to shake. Ah, I said, could you wait a minute? When I came out of the privy, he gave me a business card that read, Stubbs and Askew, general insurance agents, wind and fire coverage, our specialty. I'm in business with my daddy, he explained. Merle Stubbs? I fingered the card. I doubt if my grandma is in the market for any insurance. Mrs. Dowdle, he said. Oh, no, you can't sell her anything. He said in a jiggly, he had a jiggly Adam's apple, I noticed. I happen to be passing, he said. Between the cob house and the privy? Well, no. He looked down at his shoes. I was holed up here to tell you the truth. I'm on my lunch hour. You got Vandalia Eubanks in your house, am I right? Everybody says so, I said. Why? Do you want to sell Vandalia some insurance? No, he said. I want her. I blinked in the midday sun while he waited for me to work this out. Could you get a message to Vandalia? He asked, pulling out another of his cards. You can read what's on the back of it just to show you I mean business. I turned the card over and read, Come steal away with me, sweetheart. Let nothing no longer keep us apart. Break yourself free of your mother's rule. She'll never knew love. She never knew love, and she's just being cruel. I love you, honey. Junior. My ears burned like fire. Now that I was 13, it took less than this to embarrass me. Do your best, he said. It's now or never for me. If her old ma gets her home again, I'm a dead duck. Tell Vandalia I'll be back in the cob house tonight by dark, with hope in my heart. Then Junior cut out. I watched him scale Grandma's back fence in his suit. By mid-afternoon, I'd done all I could do on the soap pot, and a nickel was burning a hole in my pocket. I was thinking hard about a knee-high. But before I could make my escape, a car pulled up in front of Grandma's house, a 1930 Ford-modeled A sedan. A lady and a man got out and started up the front walk. I went in the kitchen door, not wanting to miss anything. Grandma was already at the front door, and Mary Ellis was hanging around the front of the stairs that led up to the bedrooms. I palmed Junior's poem to her, and she stuck it down the front of her shirt where the sausage sandwich had gone earlier. Junior will be in the cob house by nightfall, I murmured, and Mary Ellis nodded. Whatever you're selling, Merle, Grandma was saying at the front door, I don't want any. Mr. Merle Stubbs and his wife overflowed the front door. Now, Mrs. Dowdle, I'm not here in my professional capacity. I have took time off work and brought Mrs. Stubbs with me to have a friendly word with you. They got their feet in the door, and Grandma let them take chairs in the front room. "'What do you want?' she said, not sitting. "'Nothing in the world but to chat with you on a private matter.' Mr. Stubbs shifted one leg over the other. "'There's no private matter in this town, Merle,' Grandma said. "'Everybody's private business is public property.' Yes, and you've stuck your nose in ours, Mrs. Stubbs said, speaking up sharp. You got that Eubank scale upstairs this minute, Mrs. Stubbs glared at the ceiling. She's trying to steal my son and you're helping her out. She's gotten away from her ma and she'll ha and she's halfway there. Grandma's spectacles flashed her a warning. But Mr. Stubbs said, now, now, Mrs. Stubbs is upset and off her feet about our boy Junior. He's lost all his judgment and wants to marry a Eubanks. Do tell. Grandma's big arms were folded in front of her. So what? We've got a position in this community, 
Mr. Stubbs said. We don't need a connection with such as the Eubanks is. I'm as democratic as the next guy, but there's limits. Besides, Adela Eubanks is half cracked, and it could run in the family. Think of the children. Have you talked it over with Junior? Grandma asked. You can't talk sense to him, Mrs. Stubbs replied. He's bewitched. Mary Ellis and I lurked near, taking in every word. About the only thing Vindalia and Junior had going for them as a couple was that they weren't cousins. <laughs> a thud occurred then. Mary Ellis and I both heard it. Something hit the outside of the house, nothing loud, just a thud. Grandma heard. She began to drift toward the front door, but she went on talking to the Stubbses. Well, it's no skin off my nose, she said calmly, but seems like your boy's old enough to make up his own mind. How old is he? Thirty, Mrs. Stubbs said. But he's a young thirty. Grandma was at the front door now. She pulled it open and stalked outside. We all followed, naturally, to find her in the middle of the yard with her hands on her hips, staring back at the house. A ladder had appeared, propped against the sill of an upstairs bedroom window. On the top of the ladder was Ms. Idella Eubanks in her sunbonnet. She was working away, trying to jimmy loose the catch of the window screen. Grandma gazed. Of all the invasions of her privacy, this one took the cake. Oh, for the love of Pete, Mrs. Stubb looked up, shading her eyes. It's that trashy Eubanks woman trying to get her girl back. I hope she does. I hope she takes her home and sticks her down the well. Miss Eubanks had to notice the yard below was filled up with people, but now she had the screen loose and was ducking under to get inside. She had one knee on the sill. That's as far as she got. Grandma strolled over and took the ladder in both hands. She jerked it free off the ground, and it fell, scraping down the house. It must have seemed to Ms. Eubanks that the world had dropped out from under her. She had one knee on the window sill, and the rest of her was in space. She grabbed the window screen, and it came with her as she fell. She was in the air a long moment, turning as she dropped, legs working hard. Then she crashed through the snowball bushes, still clutching the screen. Jumping Jessifat, Mr. Stubbs cried, and she's not insured. The top of a nodding snowfall had snagged her sunbonnet, but Ms. Eubanks herself was down among the roots, beginning to crawl out from under the bushes that had broken her fall. Again, she was wheezing. Forgetting their differences, Mr. Stubbs would have gone to her aid, but Mrs. Stubbs took him in hand and headed to their ford. Over her shoulder, Mrs. Stubbs called back. I hope this puts an end to the entire unfortunate business, and I don't want any more interference from you, Mrs. Dowdle. Get in the car, Lula, Mr. Stubbs said, Stubbs said, and they gunned away as fast as a Ford goes. Ms. Eubanks sat in the yard, dazed. Grandma stood above her. There's my property line, she said, pointing it out. Get over it. Ms. Eubanks limped away, steaming. Where she'd parked her mule, I didn't know. If it was still alive, she turned around just off Grandma's territory. You done abdicated my girl, she howled. But I'll get her back, you watch. I looked up at the bedroom window with the missing screen. A face appeared there briefly, ghostly pale, and it wasn't Skipper the puppy. By eight o'clock that night, the whole town knew everything. Defying his parents, Lula and Merle, Junior Stubbs was known to be at Grandma's cob house waiting to make his move, and Vandalia Eubanks, tucked away upstairs in Grandma's house, was ready to make hers, in spite of her half-cracked mother, Adela. The Wabash Cannonball train was due through on its run between Detroit and St. Louis. It was going to make its usual quick stop at 8.17, and the runway couple were going to elope on it. Everybody said so. The Coffee Pot Cafe was doing its best business in several years because its front windows looked out on the, dip on the depot. Word had spread and people had driven in from all over the county to witness the showdown. The Stubbses meant to be on the platform to talk Junior out of it. The whole Eubanks clan was coming to town to get Vandalia back. Nobody agreed on how many big brothers she had, but there were several. Things didn't go according to plan, though. When the Wabash Cannonball steamed in on schedule, the town bulged with people, but the lovebirds, Junior and Vandalia, were absent. 
The cannonball pulled out without them, leaving Merlin Lula Stubbs and all the Eubankses milling on the platform. The train gathered speed past Grandma's house, and Grandma was at the front door to see it go through. Mary Alice watched from the upstairs bedroom window. But then, with a piercing shriek that rent the evening air, the powerful locomotive set its brakes. It skidded a quarter of a mile before it could come to a stop. There was a little haze that night, a little mist. Down by the haunted timber, a deathly figure stood shrouded in black, swinging an old-time lantern. The phantom brakeman seemed to hover between the tracks, dimly bathed in yellow lantern light. The engineer struck his head out of the locomotive and stared down the tracks with widening eyes. Before he could send the fireman to investigate, the ghastly figure had vanished in the haze, melted in the mist. But it gave Vindalia and Junior their chance. They came up hand in hand from the other side of the Wabash tracks and scrambled aboard the open platform at the back of the parlor car, where the cannonball pulled out again. They were on it together at last. That was one night Grandma didn't have to wake herself up to go to bed. As I came in the front room, she was there in her platform rocker saying to Mary Alice, Next time you bring a stray home, make it a puppy. Mary Alice stared. You can call it Skipper, Grandma suggested. How'd you know? I heard you tell your brother that Vandalia Eubanks was a puppy. I can hear all over the house. I got ears on me like an Indian scout, and I don't sleep. Grandma looked up at me. Get everything squared away? she asked, and yes, I had. I'd taken off Grandpa Dowdle's big old black overcoat and put it back in the cob house with the old lantern where I'd found them. <laughs>